It's episode 101 of the Author Stories Podcast. I'm your host, Hank Garner. Find all the archives of the show at hankgarner.com. And while you're there, please subscribe to the show. Uh, there's links over the right-hand side bar where you can subscribe in iTunes or on your Android device or uh, listen to it on your PC. And when you do subscribe, please rate the show to let others find it. This is a bonus episode for this week that I'm bringing you with uh, Russell Blake. Russell is always a fantastic uh, guest to have on, full of insight and uh, wisdom and humor. Uh, this show is rated PG-13 for a little bit of language. I'm really happy to tell you about a new sponsor that we have this week, the AIPP, or the Association of Independent Publishing Professionals. The AIPP is a new professional organization for freelancers who provide services for indie authors and small presses. This is one of the first organizations I've ever seen that bands together people that provide services and support for the author community. So their membership is open to editors, proofreaders, voice actors, author assistants, website designers, illustrators, graphic artists, interior book designers, formatters, cover artists. If you provide a service for authors and help support what they do, you can join the AIPP. Authors can also use the AIPP to search uh, the member directory for the professional that you need. They can also register for a free account and post a job for members to apply for. So whether you provide services for authors or you're an author looking for someone to help you do what you do, check out the AIPP. Find them at AIPPonline.org or find a link in the show notes. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Uh, today, I would like to welcome back to the show uh, Russell Blake, and I almost called you something different because your Skype name is different, and uh, I'll caught myself at the last moment. Um, but <laughs> Welcome back to the show, Russell. Thanks for uh, having me, Hank. Yeah, thank you. Um, Russell, you were on the show... Uh, about a year or so ago, episode 45, I think it was. This is episode. Has it been that long? Yeah, this is episode 102. <laughs> uh, so yeah, a lot of stuff's happened since then. No wonder and, uh, I feel like old and broken down now. <laughs> what the hell happened? I, I was young last I, time I talked to you. I think that's more the tequila than, uh, well, than anything. That's what but, keeps you youthful. Well, <laughs> there is that, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> So anyway, uh, thanks for coming back on. And, uh, Pleasure. you are one of the most prolific authors that I know. Uh, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun to watch, uh, on Facebook and, and on Amazon. And it just, as you crank out stuff, uh, left and right, what is, uh, you've got a new project out that, uh, that just dropped last week, uh, that's making a lot of waves. Uh, tell us about the day after never. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. In fact, I think, you know, I've been told it's my best writing to date and I, I don't, I, I, I don't dispute that. Um, I'm just surprised that this was the one. Um, the day after never, the first, uh, the first in the series is titled Blood Honor and it's a, uh, post-apocalyptic, you know, dystopian sort of, um, romp in Texas, New Mexico that follows a, a sort of reluctant hero um, who is forced into situations he'd rather not be in um, about five years after the collapse of civilization. And a civilization, in my, my view, collapses for two reasons, sort of a simultaneous breakdown of the fin financial system and um, in conjunction with a sort of pandemic a la Spanish flu type of pandemic. Because about once every hundred years, if you look at human history, you know, there, there, there's, you, there, there, there's a pandemic of some sort. The last one was the Spanish flu back in 1917, 1918. So we're about due in the next couple of years. There's, there's a cheery thought. <laughs> uh, th this is new territory for you, isn't it? Oh yeah, no, this is, uh, this is completely new. I mean, I've been wanting to do something in this genre for a while because I wrote a, uh, a novella last year for Steve Conkley's, um, Perseid Collapse, yeah. which was also dystopian. I really enjoyed the experience, but it was, it was, yeah, it's, it's a 30,000 or 35,000 word, um, novella and I wanted to do something that was more, 
you know, involved more world building and was more of a, you know, I won't say a Lord of the Rings kind of saga, but a, you know, sort of an epic saga set in the West that, you know, sort of explores the no country for old men kind of vibe and yet also has a, a sci-fi element to it. So that, that should turn off just about everybody right there. That description, <laughs> right. that actually, I should, I should give that to my agent. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Here's how to never describe the book. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that description is fascinating. That, uh, and is uh is not what I was expecting. That's uh Yeah, it's very it turned out um I didn't really know what to expect. It it turned out very, you know, kind of like a, a mishmash of Cormac McCarthy, like, you know, the road oh, and yeah. your you know, the old Clint Eastwood spaghetti westerns and <laughs> you know, kind of you know, Logan's run. Awesome. I mean it, it's really weird. Yeah. Uh, now, your your typical, or oh, I say typical, probably the the books that most people are familiar uh, with of yours uh, are like the Jet series, where you've got these, uh, you know, assassin um, type sure. thrillers and things like that. What was the what was the creative process like? For how was the creative process for you different in writing the Day After Never? Because I'm sure after writing so many of the others, you uh, you probably have those muscles uh, pretty well broken in. So, you know, it's it, it, a lot of that muscle memory when you sit down to write something like that, you probably fall yeah, no, into that pretty easily. You, you get you get pretty comfortable. Um, yeah. You know all the conventions. There's 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 no shocks or surprises, no no heavy lifting in terms of thinking um, other than to keep it new and fresh and to try to find a new, you know, a new approach that people hadn't read before. But um, this differed because there was real world building involved. I mean, there was a real genesis, you know, I, I needed to think through the entire genesis of the, you know, where are we in the future? Um, at what point following the collapse of civilization would be most interesting to pick up the story. I mean, there were a lot of, there were a lot of decisions that I really enjoyed making because I first thought about following through the collapse. And then I was kind of like, you know, I, that, that sounds like a great book, but, um, I'm not sure that the story I want to write is a, you know, collapse of civilization story. So maybe I can treat that as backstory and cover that in a few pages of description and then, you know, move on to the story I really want to cover. So, um, a, a lot of world building went into that, trying to figure out how people would get around, you know, what, what technology would, would still work, what technology wouldn't, um, how would the world set up? In other words, how would people organize themselves once once everything had collapsed? What would the world look like? It's pretty bleak. I mean, it's very Mad Maxy. Um, gotcha. It's very you know, it's very road warrior in some ways, except no gasoline because gas breaks down within about three four years, and diesel will break down, so there's no fuel really. So what what interested you in in not so much the collapse itself, but was uh, what what these people do with uh, with what's left of civilization and how they uh, how, how they, they adapt. how they adapt and, and and make civilization right and interact and 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 you know part of it was like well what what would likely happen in terms of you know the human condition what what sorts of of personalities what sorts of character traits would would emerge you know in terms of leadership and and the future i envision is really where where the us gets almost broken down into you know if you imagine like somalia or the middle east where there's there's warlords that sort of create these regional hubs under their control because you know in in my view when everything falls apart and there's no law there's no power there's no water there's no food um you know unfortunately it would tend to bring out the 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 worst in humans so thus the most um brutal and um ruthless sort of sociopaths would probably rule the roost at least for a while because they would be the most willing to do whatever it took right. to seize power. Right. Now, if you think I'm just describing, you know, Wall Street or the banking complex or um, <laughs> Washington D.C., you're close. But um, you know, I envision it as as you know, 
guys that were sitting on death row, you know, gangsters, just just the scum of the earth that are hardened killers already. So going out and seizing power in a situation where they know there's not going to be any cavalry coming over the hill to stop them, you know, that that, that made for a very interesting kind of um, take on the future. And it's it's not particularly optimistic in a lot of places. Well, the the news of today is not particularly optimistic, uh, and you are, are are kind of famous for sharing um, some news stories on on social media and stuff that that points out the uh, maybe the facade, uh, the, yeah, the hypocrisy it, it, that's baked into the cake in the in all of the systems. Yeah, uh, so so the your your view in this book is uh, is probably well informed by by things that you're actually observing. Well, that's the terrible part about it. I yeah. mean, that's, you know, that's really kind of the, the, the chilling part because, um, there's no part of it that isn't plausible. In other words, there's no part, you know, when you think through what happens in an economic collapse, um, if you just think it through, when, when fiat currency collapses and suddenly, you know, in conjunction with a flu, but even not in conjunction with any kind of disease, when you have an economic system collapse like it did in Argentina, like it's in the process of doing in Venezuela, like it has in Zimbabwe, like it did in Germany, um, and the, the Weimar Republic, um, it, it always follows the same pattern, which is there's a loss in faith of the paper currency, you see hyperinflation, because people demand ever greater um, amounts of the paper currency for their goods and services. You immediately have suppliers, food suppliers, for instance, gasoline suppliers, are reluctant to send their trucks on the road because they're losing money with every shipment. So what happens is you see the markets start closing down, especially in the inner cities and the areas that are the most sketchy um, because those are the ones where you start seeing the violence erupt first. Then you have food riots. Then you have just this sort of breakdown in civilization because if you can't pay your law enforcement people and you can't pay your army, you, you can't maintain order. Right. And if nobody's willing to show up at work at the dam or the nuclear reactor in order to keep the grid on and somebody's stealing all the copper wire so that they can feed their baby tomorrow, um, it breaks down pretty quickly. And there's only three days of food in the American food chain. So think that one through. Uh, day yeah. four, you're starving. Day five, you're starving. Day six, you're starving. So I maintain even really good people um, – you know, about day four without food and the kids are, are starving and the wife is starving will are forced to do really dramatically bad things just to survive. And, you know, I've read a lot of accounts in Kosovo, in, in areas that were, you know, sort of cut off from civilization and they all read the same way. And it's not pretty. And I went through that. I, you know, when Hurricane Odile hit um, the Cabo area, I was without power and water. I got out of here at like day six. But I went through six days of no power, no water, no food, no law, looting, um, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, you know, thousands of people just literally tearing Walmart and Costco and all the stores apart. Um, and it turned into Road Warrior pretty quickly. Yeah. And well, uh, Matthew Mather was on the show uh, last year and, and talking about his book Cyberstorm, and, and he he brought that same uh, point out that uh, with our kind of on-demand uh, society and our supply chain, that uh, it, it only takes a couple of days for uh, complete lawlessness to break out. Once you disrupt the the flow of, of food and water and basic supplies, uh, it goes nuts. Oh, yeah, you're screwed. And think about it in terms of hyperinflation, you know, because, okay, all of a sudden it's like, okay, nobody really wants to exchange worthless pieces of paper that are backed by nothing but the presumption of the, the government's ability to continue taxing future generations. Once that promissory note, which is just a promise to pay with more promissory notes in the future, once faith is lost in that IOU, that piece of paper, that dollar bill, 
Um, you know, a guy, uh, imagine what happens when a gallon of gas goes from you know three dollars to nine dollars to twenty seven dollars over the course of a week because the, the the trucks aren't rolling and you know they don't want the dollars at any price because they have a commodity that actually has tangible value and they know that tomorrow it's going to take even more dollars to buy anything that they that they can exchange them for to anyone willing to still accept them right. like it gets pretty crazy when you consider i posted something on my uh on my facebook page i think it was today that the average american doesn't have four hundred dollars for an emergency room visit right now think about that if you don't have 400 bucks to go to the emergency room you know what happens when you just can't get when you can't get gas when there's no potable water when there's no food the stores are empty because the trucks won't roll they can't pay a, a truck driver enough to risk his life to go and restock what happens and or, that's a fascinating question. Yeah, or when you have countries like Venezuela where, where gas is, is super cheap, but you can't buy bread or toilet paper or right, necessities. any of these. Yeah, necessities that, that you think it's, uh. No, I, I would say, you know, you, you're sitting at home and the baby's out of formula. What do you do? Right. What do you do when the baby's out of formula? Your kids, your baby, the child that you brought into the world, you love more than anything, is going to die unless you do something. So. That, you know, faced with those types of real world conflicts, um, I maintain that it, it, de- it devolves pretty quickly. And I think most people wind up not surviving because they're ill equipped to survive. Yeah. They, they aren't, you know, they're accustomed to gas coming out of the pipe when they need it. They're accustomed to electricity. They're accustomed to going and buying food when they need it. And there's always going to, I mean, it's a country where you can buy food 24-7. Right. So, the, the thought that you might not be able to eat for a week or two or a month or ever again unless you hunt, um, you know, you hunt your own meals or grow your own meals, that sort of, um, that sort of ethos just doesn't resonate because most Americans that don't live in rural areas have completely forgotten the survival skills required to survive. Yeah. Well, and even those that live in rural areas, it, that's becoming more and more scarce. We, we live in South Mississippi, a uh, uh, a a an agriculture state, and sure. when uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit eleven oh, yeah. years ago, uh, it was uh, it was a matter of hours before uh, it was just utter chaos. No, uh, I remember you know, seeing the footage of, uh, of New Orleans. Oh, it was it was insane, and then yeah. uh, and and the the Mississippi coast right next to it took the took the direct hit and uh there were a couple of of towns that are along the coast that that are just not there anymore right. uh they they used to be there and now they're not there anymore uh and we were without power for 2 weeks uh you know grocery stores are shut down uh we had someone in a neighboring town that that shot someone else over a bag of ice yeah uh it it goes nuts really it goes quickly. nuts and especially if you then throw in the if you throw in the, the concept is always you know the reason hurricane katrina didn't get worse was because there was always this idea that the cavalry would come over the hill it was a right. matter of when not if like right. This wouldn't last forever. It's a regional thing that help is on its way. We just need to hold out. But at the point where it's, nah, there's not help coming over the hill. Like, this is the best it's ever going to be. Tomorrow it's going to be even worse. Like, you know, the, the guy that you've known for 30 years that lives next door, you know, hasn't eaten for three days, and he's got three guns, and he knows you've got food. So, you know, that guy who's your best friend is going to have to make some really hard decisions, whether it's his family that gets to live or you. And right. nobody's coming to save you. There's no National Guard's going to be here if you just hold out another week or two. It's, it's over. That all of the presumption that, that, that somebody's going to keep the bad man away, that's all gone. <laughs> right. And once you understand, you know, that the only thing standing between you and the bad man is basically you. You know, most people are not equipped unless they're hardened combat veterans or, and even so, 
I mean, are just not you know, because you know, a hardened combat vet is probably used to supply chains right. and you know a, a chain of command, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So when you're just on your own against the world and it's going to go on indefinitely, um, and there are no rules, there's no rule of law, there's no um, there's no mercy being um, tendered. There's there's nothing except kill or be killed, survive or don't. Um, it becomes really dramatically um, rich to mine. Yeah. So so knowing all of this and observing all of this and and knowing that uh, that that we as a culture and as a society are uh, heading for for dire circumstances and and uh, and and heading for uh, situations that we can't print money. Uh, uh, to get ourselves out of. Yeah, I absolutely uh, believe that's maybe, you know, at most a year or two away before wow. the dollar has a fundamental collapse. So, so as a fiction writer, uh, how do you take this information that you have, this, this, this gnawing in your gut, uh, and spin this into a tale, uh, that, uh, that hopefully can do some good, or is it is it past that point, and we're just telling cautionary tales now? Well, I, I think it's no. I mean, there is some some <laughs> some hope I- I involved because you know it, the more that you understand um, how easy it is for civilization to slip back. First of all, you know, one of the things I found fascinating that I want to sort of disabuse my readers of is the notion that the world is a safe place because right. only in the U.S. and a few other countries does anyone actually believe the world is a safe place. If you live in the Middle East right now or you live in Africa right now, you know, the world is not a safe place nor has it ever been. You know, you are, you know, you are, if you live in Russia, you have, your grandparents were probably one of the 14 million people that died, you know, um, during the, the war with the Nazis. So you, you were disabused pretty by, by, by circumstance of the notion that the world is a safe, secure place where if you just keep your head down and you do everything right, you're going to be okay. And that's sort of the problem that's been sold whole cloth to, to the American citizenry is, hey, if you just give most of your money to the government, they're going to keep you safe and you'll live in this bubble, you know, that where n- nothing can really hurt you. And it's a it's it's a wonderful construct, but you know when when the veneer peels off and you actually see how quickly a Katrina, you know, shows the lie to that. Right. Um. Boy, it it gets pretty chilling because you're talking about a population that really, really, really believes that the power can't go off, that the bad thing can't happen, and I think that that's one of the reasons that. You know, I want to set it here in the in the United States rather than someplace else because a lot of other areas of the world, people know that the world's a dangerous place. I mean, they right. get it. You know, if you live in Mexico like I do, you know, most of the population understands that the government's not honest. It is trying to screw you all the time, and you know, bad <laughs> things happen every day to good right. people. Right. So they're they're more, I think, resilient because they they kind of get that um, there's no guarantee of security and safety. And I think the biggest killer, and that's what I tried to you know to infuse the book with, is the idea that one of the biggest killers um, in the early days is that 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 cognitive dissonance when your belief system that this can't happen here encounters reality. Because a lot of people just can't shift their beliefs to something that will keep them alive. I heard someone uh, uh, say one time that uh, that America is one of the the few places that that can uh, have these philosophical discussions about hell uh, when so many other places on Earth believe that they're already there. Uh, oh yeah, we, if you yeah. know, dude, if you live in Iraq or you live in Syria or you live in any of the places that the U.S. has decided for um, really essentially no reason but um, corporate hegemony and hegemony of the U.S. dollar to turn into you know dust bowls, if you live in any of those places, you, you don't know whether your neighbor's house is going to be destroyed in an hour by a don't drone strike at any day. You just don't know that. 
So the very real possibility that you could be collateral damage when you've done absolutely nothing wrong um, is as palpable as turning on a faucet and water is going to come out. Right. That's a pretty, you know, we we bear responsibility for creating that reality because it is a created reality that we're material in 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 forcing down people's throats. I'm not saying it would be unicorns and rainbows over there if we weren't <laughs> basically actively destroying about six countries as we speak, but um you know, the 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 those countries understand that hell can be um, existent in 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 their backyard at in ten minutes, and right. I don't think you get that sense. At least you know some of the interstate, certainly Detroit, you know parts of Pittsburgh. Um, there's areas, um, East LA, some areas where it's sort of kill or be killed, you know, because of all the gang violence and criminality. But I would argue that most of America really is accustomed to as a right this feeling of safety and well-being. And it's completely artificial. And it's a I, lie. It's, it's only in the last couple of generations that that's been true. If you lived in, in, in the U.S. in 1936, roughly 50% of the population that was, was, was going to go to, to, to war in World War II failed the basic army military or the army um, physical. They were because of starvation and malnutrition. So half the country couldn't wasn't even healthy enough to hold a rifle and catch a bullet. Wow! Think about that. That's that's insane. Twenty five percent of the population was literally in starvation conditions. I've read accounts where you know a, a mom with three kids, you know, is has the baby suckling on the dog's teats because you know. The dog's the only thing left that has any 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 milk to give. I mean, wow. true starvation, like Somalia level starvation, that was reality in the Great Depression in the United States. So that's all that collective wisdom. There's been no transference of that to future generations. Everyone that was around is pretty much either dead or so old nobody gives a shit what they say. But right. You know, I remember when my parents, who lived through the Great Depression, they were children, they lived through it. It it changes you so fundamentally to see that that um, you know you're never the same. Right. And it took three or four generations to rinse that out of the American psyche, so that now you've got this sort of fat, dumb, happy um, you know crowd where obesity is the number one problem, and whether or not you've got the latest generation iPhone is your biggest issue. <laughs> Oh, it's completely washed out now. There's, oh, uh, it's it's washed it, out. But it, yeah, b- b- boy, it can come back and really quickly. Yeah, uh, my grandparents uh, were were that generation that went through the depression, and I, I remember up up until they died, they they lived as if they were poor. Right. Um, and once you're through it, once uh, you go through it, right, you don't and, trust anything. Yeah, and and my my grandmother was a nurse, and uh, my grandfather was a uh, uh, was a train conductor. Uh, you know, not rich by any means, but but very very comfortable middle class uh, people. Well, a train but, conductor, you could raise an entire family and have a, a wife who oh, had no job outside of the home and four kids in a car and a house yeah. on a train conductor's salary. Right. And, and and had the ability to live very comfortably, but they lived like they were poor, uh, not not an abject poverty or anything like that. But I mean, just no, it's pit, a frugality that's it's sort a, of baked exactly, into bones. Exactly, and when they died, uh, had just dresser drawers full of uh, savings bonds and yeah. it, that 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 hoarder mentality. Like it's 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 all going to go away tomorrow. But that's because they got it. They lived in right. reality. They, yeah. you know, if you look at all of human history up until the 1950s in the United States, when basically because the rest of the industrialized world had been bombed into nothingness, 
And we didn't have any competitors, really. I mean, Europe was gone, Japan was gone, China was reeling, Russia was reeling. So we were the only industrial powerhouse, and we had convinced the world to honor our word at Bretton Woods and make the U.S. dollar the foreign reserve currency for the world. So, you know, in the 50s, not only were we supplying the currency to the rest of the world that it needed to rebuild, but we were the only real industrial powerhouse that could supply all of the goods and services that the rest of the world needed to rebuild. So there was this wild amount of prosperity which had absolutely zero to do with our moral superiority or our ingenuity or anything else and everything to do with the fact that no bombs landed in the U.S., and we basically got used to that false, you know, that prosperity which was based on the misfortune of others. And then once the others sort of rebuilt and the 70s came around and the dollar crashed and it became obvious that we had been lying about backing the dollar with gold all along and we'd done no such thing. We'd overprinted and lied to the rest of the world. When that, the dollar lost 90% of its value between about 1972 and about the mid-80s, more than 90% of its wow. buying power. So, you know, we've already gone through a 90 something percent deflation and it wasn't the dead live and, and, or inflation. Uh, it, it wasn't like, you know, the, the sky rain fire and, and, and zombies walk the, the streets. It was fairly orderly in terms of how the dollar lost all of its buying power. But I think when a fiat currency collapses, um, it didn't co- completely collapse then because the petrodollar came in. Like we did a punt, basically. We said, okay, it's not backed by, by gold anymore. So it's basically just worthless. So right. now it's got to find its own, you know, bottom. But then we sort of went in and did a deal with the Saudis where we agreed, you know, okay, in return for basically turning a blind eye to every type of just fuckery that you can throw at things, you can be as vicious and you can be miscreants at, at, a, at a, a historically unprecedented level. We will turn a blind eye to everything you do and have your back at all times, but you have to agree to exchange your oil for nothing but dollars that put a a a peg with the dollar with oil so instead of a a gold peg it was an oil peg so that was the petrodollar that's the only thing that saved it from losing 99 percent of its value but now that peg's coming apart right and there's there's only so many punts uh that that oh, you can never, do. never miss, you know, and, and never underestimate the bad guys. I mean, <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty innovative. I mean, they're working for seven to be bad some more. Right. Um, but I think what's going to happen is, you know, my take on it is there's one of three ways that this can turn out. Number one is, you know, and it's not in order of likelihood. Number one is World War Three, because if you look at the last two times that the world got a new glo- reserve currency, it was a world war that basically pulled it out of its its doldrums. Like when at the turn of the century, you know, things were all falling apart. The Federal Reserve came in and then, bam, World War I was engineered to basically wipe out the Germans so because they were the biggest industrial competitor for England. And there was a lot of other stuff, nationalistic stuff. But if you ever wondered why Germany didn't start World War I, yeah, they, and yet they wound up having to foot the bill for the entire thing. It's like, well, it's because – Britain didn't want an industrial competitor, so they gutted Germany. But basically, all of the financial misfortune that was happening around the turn of the century, bank failures, et cetera, et cetera, it all sort of pulled together, and then prosperity sort of ensued after after World War One. which, by the way, the Spanish flu pretty much shut down World War One. Like when you read accounts between 1917 and 1918, World War One basically was over because neither side could mount enough soldiers to really fight anymore. They all wow. had the flu. They were dying like like flies. What a what a disease of convenience or I don't well, know no, I think it's just that's... you know Mother Nature tends to you know have it has a rinse <laughs> cycle, and every now and then it seems like about every hundred years it gets tired of the human race and kind of goes, okay, we could lose a bunch of you, and there it wouldn't be a worse place, <laughs> right? A worse place for it. Right. So and then the, the so. 
possibility number one is World War III, and frankly, it's pretty alarming to me, as it should be to anyone that lived through the Cold War, that something that was absolutely – I would have been laughed out of any bar I had – five years ago, if I said, hey, guess what's going to happen with five years? Russia is going to be Satan again and the greatest threat to humanity, and we're going to have surrounded it with an active army and be jabbing it with a stick to see whether we can provoke it into war. And the Cold War would be restarted, and all the fears that you had in the 50s and 60s of nuclear holocaust is going to be at an even higher level than it was back then. If I had told you that five years ago, I would have been just laughed out of the room. It would have been viewed as absolutely impossible. Right. And yet, I just described what's happening as we speak. We're now putting boots on the ground in Syria for whatever reason. Oh, they're advisors. Gee, you mean like our soldiers in in Vietnam were advisors and Cambodia were advisors for years while they were in a shooting war? you got boots on the ground in a country where Russia has pretty much made clear, you know, you come screw with us, with our ally, and, you know, we're going to do whatever it takes to basically defend it. So that that's a, you know, how does that end well? Right. It, so it, it's so not. that's number one yeah. possibility is World War Three. Number two possibility is that we see a gradual loss of buying power of the dollar to the tune of – right now we're seeing real-world inflation between 8 and 9 percent. I'm not talking the CPI where they basically just change out stuff all the time when it goes up in price. Instead of measuring that inflation, they just swap it for something else and say, oh, well, consumers would make a different choice if it went up in price that much. So we'll just make the choice for them and the basket will completely change. So it doesn't measure, it doesn't measure inflation anymore. What it measures is the, the, the changing living standard of the average American. But be that as it may, if CPI is at, you know, their target is 2%, it's actually between 8 and 9%, and it has been for the last decade. So if you look at it that way, all you have to do is just, you know, multiply 8 or 9 by, by you know, 10, and you, you've lost about 80% of your buying power right there. And that we're seeing that. I mean, we're seeing it everywhere. You're seeing it at the grocery store. You're seeing it in a price of steak. You're seeing it in housing prices, in rent, in health care. In you know, you're seeing hyperinflation in the in the classic car market, in the fine art market, um, in the in the investment quality jewelry market. Um, all of those markets are hyperinflated two, three, four hundred percent over the last five to ten years because that's where the the big money goes and tries to. You know, hedge their bets by buying hard assets. They try to convert their paper currency into hard assets that will retain their value in whatever the new currency is. So we're, we're already seeing it, but scenario two is an acceleration of that to where maybe, you know, for round numbers, maybe you see 10 to 15 percent loss of buying power of the American dollar over the next five to 10 years. So that's the tame version right there. And then the not so tame version is one where, the, you know, the BRICS countries, Russia and China and Brazil and basically most of the countries that the U.S. has suddenly started saber rattling at, mm-hmm. saying you're the great Satan. China is suddenly a military threat in the South Seas. You know, they were fine up until they started the, their own equivalent of the World Bank and, you know, opened up their Chinese, um, um, gold exchange. With that is not denominated in dollars and only trades physical and have sort of made noises at becoming a new reserve currency within the BRICS nations they already are. They're exchanging their own currency. They aren't using the dollar anymore. So 30% of all the world trade stopped trading in dollars about three, four years ago when the BRICS countries put this agreement together. That's a huge hit to the American hegemony of the dollar. Right. And the dollar's hegemony is what Washington's power is based on, is its ability to influence other countries through financial warfare. So if we, if we see a collapse in faith in the dollar where people are just like, you know what? You know, if the Saudis, for instance, just said, hey, you, you break this 28 pages of your little 911 report, we're going to have to sell off $750 billion worth of treasuries. Well, yeah. okay. You know, A, that's blackmail, but I'm not surprised. But B, you know, is that maybe just a cover because they've decided they want to sell their $750 billion worth of treasuries anyway? And the U.S. said, no, 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 hang on. We need to give you an excuse so it looks like you're doing it because you're pissed. 
Like right. That's that's a very real possibility in my lexicon. Is like, you know, because I just don't believe any of the official reports of anything anymore. And I posted an article today also on, on Facebook that said that something like 94% of the country distrusts the mainstream media. Like, just doesn't believe what they say. Yet, uh, the vast majority of people will just believe uh, things that, that scroll through their Facebook um you know, stream. Uh, it's, it's a very odd time where we, we distrust what we're being told, uh, yet we, uh, as a society are, uh, you know, most people have their head in the sand and not up looking around at what's going on. It, but it's that's, a very, that's normalization bias. Yeah. I mean, I, I always hate to use this, but I mean, it's accurate. One of the questions I always had about World War II that I asked some friends of mine that went through it. You know, they were they were old, but they they were survivors of the Holocaust. I was like, you know, why didn't everybody leave? And and the, I mean, it's not like the guy didn't write a book and say what he planned to do. I mean, it, it was pretty obvious that things weren't going to go well from about the mid thirties. Why did you stay? And and you know why uh, the answer is normalization bias. Human beings are hardwired to kind of hope for the best. They're just hardwired to to kind of, boy, you know, I just can't I can't see that happening. You know, I mean, they, they just don't want to because to actually skeptically to to apply rational skepticism and just see things as ugly as they may actually be and go, holy shit, this guy's a madman. I think he might be going down the genocide road. We better get the hell out of here while we still can. That is such a scary world where that can happen. You know, your survival instincts are overwhelmed by your desire to believe it can't actually happen here. And oh, man. What a scary thing. You know, but when you ask why do so many people think everything's just fine and dandy, it's the same reason that you don't have riots in the streets right now because of our accelerating a nuclear arms race and um, getting ready to – we're jabbing the one of the three world superpowers, two of which are basically going to be allies in any conflict because of their geographical proximity, China and Russia. We're jabbing – Two countries who can kick our asses if we get into a conflict with them. I mean, the, the, it's not even subject to debate. The DOD had something like 16. I was listening to Craig Paul Roberts, um, or, and he's a fascinating, you know, he's a, he was a, a secretary of the treasury, undersecretary of the treasury under Reagan, very smart guy, Beltway insider. I was listening to him, and he was talking about that the DOD had 16 different war games that they ran, the Pentagon, with the scenarios were war with Russia, and the U.S. lost all 16. Wow. So it's not subject to, you know, it's not like, oh, that's crazy talk. Why are you so anti-American? I'm not. I just don't want to be breathing radiation. <laughs> right. You know, when the winds shift. <laughs> right. Oh, well, let me, let me ask you this, Russell. So, so we're armed with all this information. Uh, we, we see the, the tide, uh, is, is rising and it's not, uh, in our favor. Uh, as uh, as fiction writers, what can we do? Uh, you've written this book. Uh, are, are you the day after never? Are, are you beginning to hear from readers who have read it yet? Uh, has it been out long enough that you're getting feedback from people? And and are they kind of getting a sense uh, of what you're saying? Well, they they are, and yes, I have. But I mean, the I, you know, I tried not to pontificate too much because right. you know at, at, at at our job is not necessarily to make the world a better place through fiction. Our job is to create page turners that sell well. That's yeah. what we do. Right. So if we're not selling well and they aren't page turners, it doesn't really matter what our message is because no one's reading it. So no one cares. Yeah. So, you know, there's this fine line between pontificating and, you know, articulating what you view as the problems with the world and getting in the way of the story and just turning people off because it doesn't jive with their world view. And you run into that a lot. I mean, some of my earlier books that were controversial, you know, I would get people that, you know, were, oh, I, you know, I, I, I hated this. This turned into just a conspiracy theory book. You know, it's like, well, it is a conspiracy theory thriller. 
I mean, it says a conspiracy theory <laughs> thriller in the in the description. So right. who would have expected that? <laughs> but it's amazing how if I posit a conspiracy that involves Russia and China basically trying to take over the world through foul means, you know, that stands a fairly decent chance of selling a few thousand copies minimum, even if it's just a one-off. If right. I do the same thing and just replace Russia with the U.S., it's, no, it's not going to sell anything. People are just so conditioned to believe that their government is – acting in good faith and is generally good, that they just don't want to believe. They don't want to even entertain a story where it's not. And by the way, that's a big shift from the 60s and 70s when guys like Ludlam based entire careers on the idea that the government's not your friend. It's up to no good. You know, I, and think about it, civil rights, you know, everything that happened in the 60s. I mean, there was this palpable sense that Maybe the establishment and the system isn't really all that great a construct. Yeah. You know, maybe it's not all that fair to most people. Maybe it's up to no good in a lot of places. Like that was a reasonable assumption in the 60s and 70s. But since 9-11, it's almost heresy. It's treasonous to suggest that the same guys who have been caught lying – 50 times in the last 50 years about materially large, you know, issues are suddenly, you know, to suggest that they aren't virtuous and honest as the day as long as craziness and they don't want to read it. Well, okay. You know, again, I'm not in the business of, of forewarning people that don't want to be forewarned. I'm in the, I'm in the business of writing entertaining thrillers. Having said that, <laughs> I have, you know, I've been debating writing a book that I think would go as big as the Da Vinci Code. I mean, I really do, and I'm not, that's not hyperbole. But I'm also worried whether or not I would get killed if I wrote it. So mm. I, you know, I kind of enjoy, I don't have a bad life as it is right now. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, you know. And you are alive. Uh, well, there's that. <laughs> right. You know, breathe in, breathe out. You know, maybe I get a nice steak every now and then, some tequila. Life is, a, you know, it is what it is, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. So I'm not sure that, you know, being the, you know, getting tapped twice in the head and having it declared a suicide really is that an appealing <laughs> a, a, a end to my literary career. So. Yeah. Uh, I've held off on writing that. I, you know, it's, some friends of mine have said, yeah, you should just write it anonymously or, you know, just write it and then release it 20 years from now when it's obvious to most people what's going on. I'm like, you know what? I'm not sure I want to do that. Well, you just had a hundred thousand people that downloaded this on release day, uh, that are wanting to know when that book comes out you, now. You need to play with your calculator. <laughs> I want your calculator. Actually, I want Amazon to have your calculator. <laughs> so, oh man, it's it's crazy. Crazy. No, it, it did pretty well. I mean, it hit like, I want to say it peaked at like number 110 or 120 in the store. And this is a new genre for me. So. Yeah. And nice. I was very lucky. I mean, Hugh Howey, you know, um, you know, said marvelous things about it. Um, other authors, Tom Abrams, who's big in the space, Steve Conkley, you know, said nice things about it. Uh, Toby Neal, a couple of other people, um, have been very, you know, really liked the book. Yeah. Uh, how do you, how do you approach a subject, uh, like, uh, like what we've been talking about and, uh, and write from that perspective without being ham fisted and, uh, you know, without being, without pontificating. I, I know we, we talked about there's a, there's a fine line there, but, uh, as you're writing, do you, do you kind of self edit and, uh, and say, oh, I need to, I need to pull back there. This is well, like, how, how do you trust yourself to, to, to know where to draw the line? Well, I don't. I trust the reader. See, I have a pretty decent idea of who my, my target audience is. Yeah. I, mean, I have a pretty good idea of who they are and they, they're, they're fairly smart and they can read between the lines. So I don't need to club them over the head with, you know, with, with information to get them to get it. I mean, first off, you can't, you can't con someone who isn't participating in the con. They, they yeah. have to work very hard to convince themselves that the con is actually real. 
So there's going to be a certain segment of my readership that just reads stuff because I write a good yarn and they don't really give a shit what the conspiracy theory is or how much is fact and how much is fiction. They just like it because there's explosions and there's some reasonable prose and it's a good yarn. So yeah. that's one type of audience. Another audience is the audience that kind of can't get the type of fiction I write from anybody else. That, that where you know there's a message in there and you know that a lot of the stuff that's couched as fiction might not be all that fictional. And that audience, I don't need to, I, you know, I can be fairly nuanced with because they get it. Yeah. Oh, man. It's not um, easy. If this was easy, everybody would be doing it. Of course. Of course. Um, you are one of the most prolific, uh, authors that I know. Uh, how do you, how do you structure your writing to, uh, to make sure that you are able to keep, uh, cranking out book after book, uh, and maintaining the level of quality that you do? Well, I mean, you know, I, I do a lot of crack. And that, that helps uh, with the stamina. And the, I've had a couple of guests that, that have yeah. said the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's no, mostly off the record, but right. you know, well, whatever. No, I mean, come on. How are you gonna? How are you gonna denigrate my name any more than it? <laughs> <laughs> the fact that I'm even on your show twice pretty much is the exactly for that, so. exactly. Um, I, I, I'm I'm a real outliner. And I'm a big believer that at the beginning of the year, I sit down and I come up with a production schedule. And I stick to that production schedule. Um, and I do at least what production schedule is. And if I get bored or if I get a burning idea, I add that to the production schedule. Like this year, I was going to slow down to five novels. Well, it didn't turn out that way. It's going to turn <laughs> out to be more like probably seven, maybe eight, which is my editor, you know, just laughs every time I say I'm honestly going to be slowing down because she's like, dude, you're, you're not, come on. <laughs> Who are you kidding? I'm like, no, I, I really am. Uh, yeah, like you said last year and like you said the year before. It's like, right. no, I really am because I want to take more time with each book and blah, 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 blah. And I always start out the year with the best of intentions and right. I come up with a production schedule that says, here's the five books I'm going to write this year. And then I sit down and I outline them so I know exactly where they're going to start, where they're going to finish, how many pages are going to be there, you know, chapter by chapter. You know, my chapters tend to run 1,500 to 2,000 words, so I know that if I've got 45, 50 chapters, I'm, I'm more than, you know, flush with ideas for that book. Um, and that makes it, you know, it reduces it all to sort of um, blocking and tackling. So it takes all the mystery out of it. And then, of course, what happens is I then get an idea at about month number two or three, like I did for this. Like I had no idea when I started the year that I was going to write The Day After Never. I had no idea. It wasn't even an inkling. So that's three to four more novels that I originally yeah. planned <laughs> that I'm writing this year. When you have a production schedule like you do, and when you outline as meticulously as you do, uh, how do you keep the the book alive uh, when you're writing it and keep it uh, fresh and exciting uh, when you maybe feel like you've already written the book? Well, that's actually a very, very insightful question because that is probably the biggest problem I have now is the fear that I've already written this before. Right. So, um, you know, I think it's answer, something a lot of outliners deal with is that. Well, even if you're not an outliner, I think there's always a wait a second. Didn't I do this 47 books ago? Yeah. Didn't I use that device or that twist in slightly different form? So, you know, I think you have to be vigilant, but you also have to, you know, when I look at by the secret is really in a chapter by chapter outline is I, I don't have any chapters that basically could be paragraphs that I flesh out to be chapters. It's like if there isn't enough shit going on to where it is really, I mean, it's a solid 1,500 to 2,000 words of stuff. There's a surprise. There's a reversal. There's some questions that are raised that need to be answered and compel the person to turn the page. There's, you know, some, some new information about the character or the plot that demands that they move forward. If, if, if it doesn't satisfy most or all of that criteria, it's not a chapter. Gotcha. It's, it's a sentence. It's a paragraph. 
So I don't stop at a chapter until I've got it flushed out to the point where it's, you know, I'm excited about it because it's like, holy shit, this is where, you know, I can build this in and there's even more nuance and that guy who I thought was really good may actually not be so good. And there's three questions that have been raised in the reader's mind that will have to be answered later. And okay, now we've got a chapter. So I just do that chapter by chapter when I drill down. And I don't just go, oh, yeah, well, I can have a couple where not much happened. No, it, every chapter has to do its work. And if it doesn't, it shouldn't be there. So if you apply that rigorous sort of demand on a chapter by chapter level, you're not going to get, um, you're not going to run into the, oh, haven't I done this before? You know, how do I keep this fresh? The answer is you think it through when you're outlining. You make your brain do all the creative work during the outlining process and you don't just foist it off for, oh, when I'm writing, I'm sure something will come to me. It's like, yeah, all you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to pay that forward and hope that in the future I will do all the thinking required. So I just force myself to do all the thinking now. And I don't move on until it satisfies where I go, holy shit, that chapter. Right. Well, now, that brings a, uh, another question to mind is, uh, it seems like you write very quickly if you're, if you're putting out, uh, five, seven, nine, uh, novels a year, uh, it seems like that writing goes very quickly. But, uh, if you're putting in that much work on the front end, uh, how, how much pre-writing, uh, goes into each book? How much time does it take to, to do that chapter by chapter outline? Uh, you know, I've get... never spent more than three days, four days on, you know, but I mean, it, they're eight hour days. Right. I mean, it's a job. It's just, that's one thing that most authors don't get until they actually start selling books and it becomes successful. This is a job like any other, and if you're not signing up to 40 to 60 hours a week of doing the job, then you're probably not gonna do well. Just that simple. Yeah. It's not right. a leg. It's not you write one and then you sit back and date supermodels and you know <laughs> appear on reality shows. It doesn't work that way. It can, but you know, for most people, it doesn't. So this is a job where you block and tackle every day. You schlep to your desk. You sit down with your coffee. You start at eight in the morning and you don't stop until you've hit your word count. Period. You just don't. You don't do it. If it takes you till midnight to hit your word count, then it takes you till midnight. But right. you, that's how you do it. Just like you were working on assignment as an independent contractor where you have a firm deadline and they don't really care whether life got in the way or how you feel or, you know, whether, whether you're really, your biorhythms are aligned or they, they don't care. They want the result at the agreed upon time. So right. you just have to be the worst asshole of a boss that you've ever had. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I talked with a, uh, uh, with an author one time who, uh, said that, that it, uh, can take him upwards of two to three months to write a 10,000 word short story for submission to a, to a magazine or publication or, or something like that. And I thought that was the most bizarre, uh, yeah, what's thing he doing ever. the other, like, you know, 58 it, days? It, exactly. Like, uh, for, for a, a, air quotes, professional writer, uh, my thinking is uh, someone ought to be able to order a story from you on Monday and, and you turn in a completed draft on Friday. Dude, you're a content uh, creator. You are exactly. a content creator just like you were working in the games industry or you were writing for films or TV. You are creating content. And if you think that the guys on a show like 24 sit around going, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have this week's episode because, you know, I've really been feeling kind of bloaty and I, you know, my cat's sick and oh, a lot of things. No, it's, you, you don't want the job. There's 50 guys waiting to just, right. to take it. So I, I think it's all about, you know, personal discipline and just, you know, it's more, I, I found most things in life really are about just perspective. Just philosophy and perspective. If you view this as not only doable, but doable by you, if you just work hard enough. In other words, if you view this as something you can be successful at, and because maybe you're not Tolstoy or Joyce, um, you, you don't possess the raw talent that will just shock and amaze everyone when they're exposed to it, then the other way to do it is just through sheer bust-ass hard work. 
And if that's your edge, if that's the way you're going to be an exception, then okay, get ready. You're signing up to 60 to 80 hours a week for the first four to five years. I don't think there's been one week in the last – I've been writing. June will make five years that I've been doing this, and I don't think there's one week that I haven't clocked at least 70 to 80 hours. Do you see that changing uh, in yeah, the future at all? Yeah, I see it changing. <laughs> No, it's true. See, every see, I, I tried to pin you down again, and you just no. Didn't every work. year, I see, uh, I go, this cannot continue. But you know, I, I wrote a blog about this the other day. It's kind of like because I, you know, I was sort of thinking it through and going, why am I doing this? I mean, I've got a backlist of almost fifty books. I've written two with Clive. You know, I've done the traditional publishing thing. I'm making plenty of money. Why am I doing this? Why am I chasing myself so hard? And driving myself, and I think the answer, you know, I mean, the answer I came up with on the blog was truthful. It's like one, because I'm afraid that the last one, that those other 49 or 50 books were all flukes, and I'll never write anything decent again. Not that I'm claiming I've written anything decent so far, but if you buy into the idea that some of it's readable, I'm afraid that that, that it's over, and I'll never be able to do it again. So part of it is to reassure myself every day that, oh, I can... Yeah, I can still turn a phrase. Okay, yeah. so far today, things are going good. Yeah. <laughs> Don't know about tomorrow, but <laughs> – so there's there's that fundamental insecurity that all artists, all content creators feel that, you know, is this all a sham? Am I really – is this real? Because, you know, or did I just trick everybody? You know, and when are they going to figure it out? Or when is the market going to change? And suddenly nobody wants to, to, you know, read vampire books anymore as an example. Right. Right. You know, anybody um, that's shopped to traditional publishing as knows that, you know, you can write the best book in the world. You can write a number one bestseller and it will be declined by 99% of all of the, the professional big brain MFAs sitting in New York offices that read it. Oh, sure. And, and insert name of, of, Famous author we all love. They all they all have a story of how many people turned them down. They have the same story. Exactly. Right. So so, um, you know, I mean, I I think I'm I'm sort of I I won't say I'm jaded or pragmatic or cynical though I probably am all three of those things. But my main thing is I'm just afraid that I won't be relevant anymore. That my work won't be engaging and it won't be worth reading. So I feel this 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 pressure. To, to get out as much as I humanly can on paper before I either drop dead or before my audience drops dead or before the sea goes out and, you know, there's just nobody interested in reading the kind of thing that I, I write. Because I can't – look, if I could write a heartwarming romance about a woman that returns to take over the ranch and, you know, gets it on with the, the, the hot, you know, 22-year-old cowboy, I would be writing that shit all day long. But <laughs> I can't. I've got the wrong set of chromosomes. It's just <laughs> – I can't do it. So what I write is the stuff I like to read. And the problem with that is I'm not sure how long – you know, New York says – Every year, New York says men's fiction is dead, and the reason is demographically, it's a sound, it's a sound thing to say because most something like what eighty five, ninety percent of all readers are women. Right. Uh, so if you're a betting man, are you going to put your money on something that appeals to men? Or are you going to put it on something? <laughs> are you going to sign the next Clive Cussler, or are you going to sign the next Gone Girl? Right. Are you going to sign the next Hunger Games, or are you going to sign the next uh, Da Vinci Code? Right. So, you know, there's decisions that are being made, but they're being made for economic reasons, and those are absolutely valid ways of making decisions. And I just look at it, and I kind of go, you know, I'm not sure how much longer anyone's going to give a shit that I've written a new book. So I want to continue striking while the iron is hot so that I can get all my ideas out there and not go to my grave going, damn, if I had only done it a little more, you know, pedal to the metal, you know, yeah. I wouldn't feel like I, you know, I like I had left money on the table or I had cheated myself by just not trying hard enough. So that's well, and- really the driver. Very neurotic, by the way. Yeah, 
Well, I, I think a lot of us are. You know, there's uh, uh, there's something to be said for um, you know people that that uh, choose to read what we do, and it's uh, it's a it's a powerful opiate for sure. And if you if you can harness your own neuroses and figure <laughs> out a way to have it fuel your productivity. Right. I mean, that's that's you know at least that makes your psychosis more <laughs> empowering. You know, it's it's fine to have a hallucination that you can fly if you become a pilot. It's not so good <laughs> if you're living on the ninth floor and you're uh, had a little too much to drink. So. Right. Right. Uh, speaking of Clive Cussler, you, you did do two books with him. Yeah. Uh, what was your experience? And, and we're going to wrap up in just a second. I know we're going long, but, um, uh, you, you obviously have found great success in self-publishing, uh, with KDP and, and all of the tools that, 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 that affords us. Uh, do, do you have an opinion about the, the divide between, uh, traditional publishing and self-publishing and, and, and kind of what that landscape is like for authors now? Oh, I think, I, you know, I think that unless you're one of the top, you know, 0.001% of traditional published authors, you are, um, you know, you, you better be doing it for bragging rights because that's about all you're going to have. It ain't going to be money. So, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's just a tough landscape out there. I mean, budgets are smaller, advances are smaller. Um, the average, the average traditionally published author is lucky if they're, if they're, you know, only having to work one job to survive. Um, in addition to their their being traditionally published, whereas I mean, hey, being an indie is also hard work, and the odds are also very long. But um, you know, a guy like me who is basically a B list sort of um, author, I haven't had my big breakthrough novel, which is going to you know I can I can drink on it for the next twenty years. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm a working author, and sort of the way I look at myself, like Bradbury or Asimov or any of the guys that came from that tradition of okay, I'm going to have to write two hundred to two hundred and fifty books during my right. lifespan to pay the bills and have a decent quality of life. You know, and that's what they did. So Philip K. Dick, you know, all these guys that came from that work ethic, you know, sort of pulp fictiony, um, paperback world, you know, just were resigned to they're going to work from the time they're 40 to 80 years old and they're going to probably put out hundreds of books by the time yeah. they're done. So, you know, I, I think that that's lost now. That's gone from traditional publishing. You don't well, have that option. Well, and they, it kind of comes full circle to what we were talking about earlier that, uh, there See, is this, that. yeah, I know, it's, it's, uh, we do have this, this false sense of, uh, that everyone is going to be a phenomenal overnight success. We're going to write one book, we're going to, uh, we're going to retire to the beach, like you said, we're going to drink on it for 20 years. Uh, but that is, that's never been the reality for writers. That, that's the reality for a minuscule, Amount of people, and in most of those that we love are are working authors. Also, they've just you know that they're cranking out work also. Um, but th- there really is this really warped sense of uh, uh, of what is possible, and we and live what in an we should age where we've been for. sold just you know bromides and aphorisms and illusions. We live in a society and in a world where, you know, fairy tales are, are represented to us as the truth by virtually everybody, by the media. Wall Street tells you that if you just do the right things, you're going to wind up rich. You know, I mean, you know, society tells you that if you're just a good worker bee, you're going to have a nice life. There's all of these bromides that are, are fed to people and the, the author business is no different. The publishers advance this notion that you might win the lottery and be the next, you know, I don't know, Neil Gaiman, you know, and, and you're going to be huge and you're going to write six books in your entire career and be a multimillionaire off of all of them. Okay, sure, that can happen, but it ignores that 99.9999999999% of the time, it doesn't happen. Right. And that's why hey, I, I come back to skeptical, you know, rational skepticism. Where if somebody tells you, oh, yeah, I'm going to write the next To Kill a Mockingbird, and it's like, hmm, hmm, okay, knock yourself out. I mean, I wouldn't kill someone's dream. I would say maybe you will. You should. 
go for it. But if you're really thinking about being able to quit your J job, um, my advice is don't just write that. Be prepared to write 200 more because the one that becomes To Kill a Mockingbird may be number 193. Right. You don't know. You have no way of knowing. Yeah. You don't – Hugh, God bless his soul. I mean, very talented author. Um, Hugh Howey, I mean, when he wrote Wool, he was just writing another story. Right. He had no idea. So yeah. it, it's kind of like, you know, you don't know what's going to catch. So, you know, you, you need to take tremendous joy and pleasure from the act of writing. In other words, you need to get as much out of that. It's, it's a very selfish act. You're, you're alone. You've closed out the rest of the world and you're living in your head. And then you're putting it down on paper or on a screen, pixels. Um, and, and you are sort of a god. You're a creator. And then your hope is that you'll be able to sell that to a bunch of people. And then you get the Olsen twins in a big boat. Okay. But <laughs> the odds of you getting that are so slim. You better. You better suck all of the juice out of the enjoyment of that process of laying it down, of thinking it through, of writing, of creating. The content creation, really the, the reward has to be that you would do it even if it paid nothing because the likelihood is it, it's not going to pay anything. Right. And, and you – and if you're caught up in all that neuroses, uh, then you miss out on, on the joy of doing the work. Uh, you know, we, we've lost the sense of, uh, of accomplishment and the joy in, in creating things and, uh, uh, you know, because we're, we all just want to skip all that and be millionaires. Well, uh, everyone, so enjoy wants the to work. Be, everyone wants to be the millionaire. I mean, I get it. And we're in a society. I mean, think about the shows that were on TV. You know, who wants to marry, be a millionaire? Who wants to marry a millionaire? You know, The Bachelor. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, it's a quick fix. You know, it can happen overnight. We all want to be a Kardashian. All we have to do is put out a sex tape, and now suddenly we're driving a Rolls, and we got our own reality show. Everyone wants that, but that's not the real world. I mean, it's just it doesn't happen that way for most people. So you have to, you know, as I've gotten older, it's I've I've just sort of realized that you know we are all special snowflakes in our own way, but. We are really not all that different from the billions and billions of people who have lived and died before us. Right. And they all had dreams and thought they were special and blah, 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 and they're gone. And we've never heard of almost all of them. And <laughs> we don't miss their passing you know, right. we're, because we're so focused on us. So – during that being so focused on us, recognize that we're likely to also be one of the billions of people who also pass and nobody gives a shit about, you know, a hundred years ago uh, or from now. And just recognize that that is probably the truth. So it is incumbent upon us to create meaning. We have to create our own meaning and not look for external validation. And as content creators, you know, our validation has to come from the uh, job well done. Now, yeah. as business people trying to sell the content we create, that's a different matter. Now we're talking about operating a publishing company. That's completely different than being a competent content creator. And I keep making that separation, and people either love it or hate it, but it's the truth. Content oh, creation truth. has nothing whatsoever to do with operating a publishing company. Yeah. And, and those are the, the, the two things that we have to have our feet in now. Uh, you have to be really good at both. You do. You do. And, uh, uh, for, for good or ill, that, that's just the way it is. It's just reality. It's yeah. Like, oh, and, and, why, why don't dogs live to be 50 years old? It's because the world's a shitty place. It always has been. You know, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Right. So. Well, and the, the sad reality is, is that that is true for most traditionally published authors as well. Of so, it is. Whereas they, they may not, uh, ru- may not be running their own publishing business, but they're absolutely running their own, uh, promotion and, uh, and marketing business for sure. It's true for everybody in almost every walk of life. If you're yeah. doing something that doesn't involve punching a clock, 
and just showing up and shuffling around and then leaving when your shift is over. If you're involved in any kind of an endeavor, and I think more and more people are as the economy gets worse and worse and as jobs get exported, you know, if you're self-employed, if you're a performance-driven, you know, um, compensation scheme, you already recognize that your success is is largely going to be contingent upon your willingness to basically do everything. Like if you're a sales guy and you just go out and you call on people and you do the bare minimum or you know right in line with everybody else, you're not going to be the guy getting the gold Rolex at the end of the year. Like that guy is going way above and beyond the call of duty to figure out – anticipate his client's needs to figure out how to sell more 24 7 he's focused on doing that and that's why he's the guy that gets the big bonus every year and it's just that it's just true in everything it's not just just being an author it's just life right uh russell it's been a uh this has been a a very fast uh over an hour hour and 50 chatted minutes up. i know Holy <laughs> uh the the new book that you have out is the day after never i see that uh never, blood uh, honor blood That's honor and, and i see that purgatory road is uh already up for pre-order yeah, uh the, the follow-up to that and that's coming out in may is that yeah, right it's coming out uh, at the end of may excellent Six so what apart. else what else do you have coming up? I have the next one, which is Covenant in the uh, series. will be coming out six weeks after that, so probably wow. July, somewhere in that mid, early to mid-July. And then I don't okay. know whether the book's going to require, whether the series is going to require three or four, but at this point I'm feeling like it's probably going to be four because okay. I thought I had a trilogy, but then I've come up with – I mean, it just keeps wanting to go in this other direction where it's going to take another 75 to 100,000 words to completely close it. <laughs> so it's like, all right. Is there anything, uh, anything else coming from Jet? Uh, yeah, I'm going to write, you know, I'm going to write at least one more Jet this year, possibly two, but probably just one more. I'll probably write the fourth day after Never Book this year. I will be releasing, I've already written it, The uh, Third and the Ramses, which is an amazing book, by the way. Awesome. Um, it's called The Goddess Legacy, and I, I trust me, this is one that fans of Kessler are going to just go apeshit over. I mean, it's, awesome. it's all that. Like it's it's a it's a good book, so I'm excited about that. That'll probably come out in in summertime, you know, somewhere around August. Okay. So I've you know, and maybe you know, I don't know. I may write the uh, conspiracy to end all conspiracies. I don't know. I may do that and just not release it. So I, you know, do it, Russell. Do it. Yeah, boy. You know, <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> no, just the research of- to do that book will take probably at least three months. Not to research it. I know it cold, but to to be able to document everything right. so that it's completely. It's a lot of work trying to stay alive. Yeah, and then I've got to dodge the drones and black <laughs> helicopters. So right. maybe maybe I'll park that and do that some yeah. other time. Yeah. Uh, Russell, thanks for taking time to come on the show. Uh, I'm going to send everybody over to your website and to your Amazon page to go uh, stock up on everything they need to know about surviving the apocalypse. Yeah, tell them to buy the book. If they don't like it, just return it. For Christ's sake. Okay, I mean, we'll do. All right. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate your time. All right. Nice talking hey, to you. You too. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. I do hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, please go to iTunes and rate the show. Uh, give us uh, five stars or whatever you think it deserves. And while you're there, please leave a comment. Also, remember, Author Stories Insiders uh, get access to the shows early. So go to HankGarner.com and click on the Insider link, and you can subscribe. It's only $10 a year. And have access to our super secret forums where we talk about upcoming shows and get early access. Thanks for listening.